All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I'll pray for us. Father, thank you for letting us uh, study at Bryan College. Thank you for protecting us uh, so far this semester from the COVID pandemic. I pray that you help us uh, finish out this semester well. I pray that uh, the classes this week and next week, uh, all our classes, that they would be encouraging, that it would be a means of grace to help us love you more and love other people more and to be people of grace. Father, thank you for the grace that you've extended to us. Um, I pray today as we look at the eschatological teaching of the New Testament that um, you give us a generosity of spirit to uh, those who may hold different views. I pray you give us an allegiance to your word to believe exactly what your word teaches. And in the midst of this prayer, we uh, confess that we would like greater wisdom um, to understand uh, your word, to think your thoughts after you. Uh, would you help us today? And we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. So as always, please uh, take attendance quiz 36. And thank you to those of you who have started to come by my office. Uh, you'll remember the agreement we made that if you show up for class and you do a good job on the homework and uh, memorize the, the memory verses that you don't have to take the final exam. And so many of you have started to come by and um, I have to say I'm very, very impressed with the, the job that you all uh, are doing with that. So uh, anytime I'm in my office, if you see my door is open, you're welcome to come by and say your verses. It takes about five minutes. Uh, and if you've uh, been here every day or made up your uh, excused absences by watching the YouTube videos. If you've done your homework and can say the uh, memory verses, then you can uh, forego the final ex exam. And uh, the Greek word for that is bribe. Uh, it's an encouragement for you to come to class and to do your homework on time. And I want to reward you uh, for uh, doing that. So, um, if you haven't uh, come by to, to say those verses, please take time to do that. That is 15% uh, of your final grade, so you don't want to just uh, let that go by the wayside. So what we're doing today, we're continuing this look at the eschatological discourse. Some people call it the Olivet Discourse. It's basically Mark 13 in parallels, and we are about halfway through, so this is going to be the second part of that uh, discussion that we started last time. And the main question is, is Mark 13 talking about the end of the world? Is it talking about the end of the uh, Jewish temple? Or is it somehow talking about both those things at the same time? What's the evidence for those views? And does it really matter? Uh, uh, where we come down on the issue of eschatology. So that's uh, what we're looking at and why we're looking at it. And of course, central to this is going to be the event in 70 AD uh, that happened on Yom Kippur in 70 AD when uh, the Roman armies under uh, Titus sacked uh, Jerusalem and tore the temple down brick by brick and carried off uh, the furniture that we see here on the Ark of Titus in the Roman uh, Forum. Um, how is that event, that horrific event in um, Jewish history, how is that related to what Jesus is saying in Mark 13? And of course, if you're really interested in this, uh, I've linked a document to the announcement page uh, where you can see all the text uh, put side by side uh, in order with all the parallel texts that um, are most important. And if you uh, 
download that, you can follow along better in these discussions. And of course, there are three basic approaches that people take to the material in the eschatological discourse. A very popular approach is just straight futurism, that everything spoken of in the Olivet discourse is about the end of the world. Uh, this is a very popular way of addressing these texts. Uh, uh, you'll hear this approach on the radio often, um, that basically what's being spoken of in Mark 13 and parallel, um, you don't really have to know anything about 70 AD because it's about events that are yet future to us. A uh, popular scholarly view is to see an element of preterism and an element of futurism in the text that perhaps the main um, reference is the destruction in the 70 AD, but somehow that that destruction foreshadows a greater destruction that will happen at the end of the age. And then there's uh, preterism. Uh, and when I say preterism, I mean partial preterism where many predictions, 90%, uh, 95% of the predictions are about uh, 70 AD with only a small reference to uh, events that are still future to us. So those are the three kind of main ways of looking at that, and that's what we've been going through uh, last time. We saw that the key passages are the ones we're working through today in the eschatological discourse. Uh, next time, we're going to look at the date of the book of Revelation. For those of you who are uh, making up uh, uh, some of the missed homeworks and you maybe need one more uh, homework to fill out one you missed, well, you're welcome uh, for next time to... Uh, uh, read, take two hours and read through the book of Revelation and just make some notes. You can email that uh, to me, and I'm more than happy to count that as one of your homework assignments. But for most of you, I think you've already done uh, the 28 you need, and so uh, I pro probably won't list that as a separate homework just so you aren't confused uh, there with having to do that. But that's what we will look at next time, because this is going to be massively uh, connected with how you understand the eschatological discourse. If the book of Revelation is written pre-70 AD, then uh, perhaps large measures of it will be about the destruction in 70 AD. If it's written in 96, when most scholars, modern day scholars say it was written, then it probably has very little to do with uh, the destruction in 70 AD. And so we're going to have to look at that, but that's for next time. What we're looking at now will be these texts. Um, and where we left off last time in Mark and Parallels, it said, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, and then it says, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And as we closed out Last time we talked about uh, how um, Mark in the parallel text at least may have some reference to what's called the Christian flight to Pella in 66 AD, according to Eusebius, writing in 325 AD. Uh, he describes an event where the Christian church in Jerusalem fled. And if we took time to look at the, um, the details of that event, what happened in 66 AD is uh, Jerusalem was surrounded by armies and uh, the Christian church was besieged together with the um, ethnic Jews and they were all going to be starved to death. Um, uh, that's how siege, sieges uh, work. Uh, they cut off the food supply. The water supply there in Jerusalem is very limited, and you just starve people to death. And uh, when people run out of food, they begin to res uh, resort to um, uh, 
thievery, and then the ones who are strongest will end up torturing those who are less strong, and uh, eventually uh, the people in the siege will turn to uh, cannibalism, and then uh, eventually they'll kill themselves or uh, surrender. And that's what was facing the Christian church in 66 AD. But when Jerusalem was surrounded by armies, the Roman army heard a rumor that Egypt was attacking, and so the siege was broken. And when the Roman army went to face the uh, Egyptian army, which was a phantom, it was just a rumor, when that siege was broken, the Christian church got out. Uh, they left and fled and crossed the River Jordan into uh, the uh, territory there um, in modern-day Jordan and went to the city of Pella. And they uh, weren't starved to death, and they didn't die in the siege. So Eusebius, and at least some scholars, think that uh, this abomination of desolation and let the reader understand and let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Many scholars are saying that's what happened in 66 at the uh, beginning of the uh, siege of Jerusalem. Uh, it's very odd, too, at least to me in terms of chronology. Um, if you follow the basic chronology of Jesus' ministry, he starts his ministry... Uh, halfway into the year 26 AD. And it's interesting that exactly 40 years later um, is the start of the siege. And if you take uh, Jesus' death at 30 AD, then exactly 40 years later is when the temple was destroyed. And then if you take the stoning of Stephen, exactly 40 years later is when Masada fell you wonder if uh, there isn't some kind of meta narrative, eloquent symmetry about the chronology uh, going on. But, uh, you know, uh, you want to be a Berean and look at it and say, well, you know, is this what that is talking about or not? Of course, we saw that Pella is here, uh, right across the Jordan River into the uh, non Jewish territory. Um, we ended our talk last time where the vultures gather, um, where the corpse is, there the vultures gather. And we saw that, at least in Greek, this word vulture uh, is normally the word eagle. Um, uh, eagles can eat dead things. Uh, they don't eat dead things the same way vultures do. Um, eagles usually eat live things. But this could be a reference, if you're taking a more preteristic approach, um, to the um, Roman standards which surrounded Jerusalem. Um, so it's more information. Uh, perhaps it's uh, making this more cloudy, but we want to look at the evidence from all sides. So what we're going to look at today is this thing about Daniel. Um, Mark, uh, or one of, one of the accounts, tells us, let the reader understand, and then it says the abomination of desolation spoken of in the prophet Daniel. Well, what in the world is that talking about? Well, there is an obscure passage, a debated passage, um, in Daniel 9, uh, 24, um, it's just a few verses long, and it's been the subject of debate among Christians for many, many years. But this is basically what it says. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to, one, finish the transgression, two, to put an end to sin, three, to atone for iniquity, four, to bring in everlasting righteousness, five, to seal up vision and prophecy, and six, to 
Messiah a most holy place. So six things are promised, uh, 70 weeks, and apparently those weeks uh, represent a year apiece. So um, God is saying 490 years uh, from some date, uh, start some date, 490 years later, uh, something spectacular is going to happen. And it includes these six things. But I want you to notice something. This is the ESV, to anoint to Messiah a holy place. So that's the ESV. I want you to look at the New American Standard. So the sixth one in the New American Standard is to anoint the most holy. And what do you notice about the word place? Well, what you should notice is that it's in italics. And any time a word is in italics in a translation, they're telling you that that word isn't actually in the text, but it's being added by the translators. So the phrase in Hebrew is to anoint the holy of the holies. And then you have to ask, what is that holy of holies? Well, if we look at the entire Hebrew Bible, there are three things that are called Holy of Holies. The place at the center of the temple, that little cubic room, uh, 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet. Some sacrifices are called uh, Most Holy or Holy of Holies. And then there are people who are called Holy of Holies. So Aaron is called Holy One of holy ones. And so if you look at English translations, there are some people who will um, talk about this being kind of the a rebuilding of the temple. There are other people who are going to supply the word person here and interpret it of the Messiah. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a big difference to me. And what's interesting about um, debates about eschatology is it seems like a lot of people have insistent, very firm opinions, but very few people have time to actually study the text and learn the languages and, and to try to see what this is saying. And I think that's a disservice. Um, uh, as, as I've studied this, uh, uh, spent some years studying it, uh, I, I've realized that this is difficult stuff. And um, this isn't the kind of thing that you can just come to uh, any English translation and say, well, that one's good enough for me, particularly if an English translation isn't telling us that, hey, this word isn't in the original. I've, I've just put it there. Um, and so what we have to do is we have to look at all the evidence. We have to get lots of Bibles. And in particularly in this passage, there are major decisions in the original language that are difficult decisions. And so um, someone who comes to this say, oh, well, the answer is obvious. Um, I don't know anyone who's dived into the, the original language of this and say, oh, there's an obvious solution. Uh, it seems to me there's evidence for different views, and we, we as Christians need to look at what that evidence is. So what we know for certain is that there are 490 years, uh, that it starts from an event and it ends an event. And there are two major ways scholars have interpreted these 490 years. The most common way to interpret it is from the decree of Artaxerxes uh, to rebuild Jerusalem wall. And that happened in 445 BC. And if you count 445 uh, to about 32 AD, you're going to get 483 years. So that the death of Jesus uh, from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, that that's basically 
uh, 69 weeks. And then the idea is something happened so that the prophetic clock stops. And then at a point yet future to us, there'll be the 70th week. And that's where you get the 70, seven years of the tribulation. Now, I don't know about you, but when I became a Christian, I knew that the tribulation was seven years. Um, I knew that it was a bad event, but I didn't know what the evidence for it being seven years was. And as I poured through scripture, I realized that there is no evidence for seven years of the tri tribulation other than the assumption that the tribulation is the missing week from this 69 weeks. This is the standard way within conservative Christianity to understand the 490 year prediction. And so it's understanding the 69 weeks somehow connected with Jesus' death. And then there's one remaining week yet that will happen. And that week is sometime in the future. And in the middle is a gap uh, of which Daniel knows nothing about. Um, there are 483 years and then a gap and then seven years will complete the 490 years. Um, it was a long time into my career as a, a student of the Bible before I realized that that's not the only way to count those years. Uh, a whole different group of people counts it this way, that the decree starts with the decree, um, oh, I should have put down the man's name, but it's the decree in 457, and that that goes, 483 years goes to the start of Jesus' ministry. I would put this at 26.5, but a lot of people put it at 27. Three and a half years later, and I put the uh, year 30, but some people, the person who did this uh, on the internet did 31. You have three and a half years. At the three and a half years after Jesus started his ministry, he was crucified. Three and a half years later, which I'm going to put at 33 and a half, is when Stephen st was stoned and the gospel went out to all the nations of the world. If you take this view, there is no gap. There is no uh, remaining week. Uh, there still might be bad stuff that happens because the destruction in 70 AD could be foreshadowing a future event. But there's nothing to say that it's going to be seven years. And there's nothing to say that it's that event that's completing Daniel's uh, prophecy. Rather, uh, what uh, the Daniel prophecy is about is about Jews rebuilding Jerusalem and um, and then the temple becoming people as the gospel goes out to the world. Those are two radically different ways to understand this prophecy. And when I became a Christian, uh, I remember that if you were a Christian, you, you had to have a Rari study Bible um, if you didn't have a Rari study Bible, you know, you weren't really an evangelical. I remember those days, and and uh, the Rari study Bible is going to present this. But there are other ways to look at it, and it's not like uh, Christians have been unified on this. Good people have held radically different views about this. And so what should we do? 
what, what kind of evidence should we look at? Well, we might notice this. In Daniel 9, we meet an angel who is named. And I can count on one time, uh, on one hand, the times angels are named in the Bible. Uh, the angel Michael is named, and the angel Gabriel is named. I think Gabriel is named three times. Um, Michael uh, may be named once, it may be twice, but angels usually aren't named. This angel is named. It says, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, and Gabriel's name means something like uh, God is the warrior. Uh, it's related to the word uh, Gibor in Hebrew, which is like uh, God is called El Gibor, the warrior God. So this is like God's chief fighting angel comes to Daniel at the beginning of his confession and uh, Gabriel says, I have a message from God for you. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision, at the first came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. We don't uh, understand this until we look at the whole Bible, but the evening sacrifice is three o'clock. That's the same time that God confronted Adam and Eve in Eden when they sinned, and it's the exact same time that Christ died on the cross. That's very interesting uh, to me that that would happen. It's also when Jesus first met his uh, disciples in John 1. You wonder if there isn't some kind of meta narrative uh, thing going on there. Gabriel came and he said, uh, 490 years and then something important is going to happen. Well, the only time we meet Gabriel after that is in Luke 2. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The fact that Gabriel only shows up connected with these 490 years when it's revealed, and then to the Virgin Mary. Uh, he also shows up uh, slightly before in Daniel and slightly before this when John the Baptist is born. But those are the only time that Gabriel shows up in the Bible. The fact that it's at the beginning and end suggests to me that all of this has something to do with the 490 years. That the 490 years are somehow about Jesus and what Jesus did. So, when we come to the eschatological discourse and it talks about the abomination of desolation, and Daniel is talking about the abominations of desolation, the question arises, is this something to do with 70 AD or is it something to do with the end of the world? And it seems to me that where you come down on this issue is going to determine a lot about where you come down on is it 70 AD or is it um, uh, the end of the world. Now, when we come to this text, it says this, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. And many who take a futurist view will say, this clearly hasn't happened. And you'll even hear people say, just go outside at night and look at the sky and look at the ground, and if you don't see stars on the ground, then this cannot have happened yet. That's a pretty good argument. That's a fair argument. Um, if this is about 70 AD, when do the stars fall from heaven? When uh, is the sun darkened? When does the moon not give its light? And 
all the texts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, all say that. And so the futurists will say uh, this is a, uh, a, a slam dunk that this can't be about 70 AD because these verses haven't happened. Those who take a more preterist approach will say, will ask the question, is this a quotation from the Old Testament? And the answer is, it is a quotation from the Old Testament. And given the fact that it's a quotation from the Old Testament, what should we do? We have two options. We can skip it and just make up our view without the text, or we can go to the text and look and see what it says. I think we should do the latter. Uh, and if we do that, this is the chapter we're going to go to, the oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw. In other words, when we look at Isaiah 13, Isaiah 13 is going to tell us about when Babylon uh, was destroyed in 586 B.C. And this is what uh, Isaiah says, The stars of the heaven and their constellation will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. This is how Isaiah is describing the God-hating, rebellious, wicked kingdom of Babylon and how God is dis describing their destruction. In other words, if we were um, steeped in the Old Testament and we hear a passage about the sun being dar darkened and the moon not getting their light, our mind would immediately go back to the sacking of Babylon in 586 as the God opposing hostile power against the people of God, the place where the people of God were exiled. Well, if you read it that way, it might not be talking about a literal stars falling from the heaven. It might be talking about something else. I don't think that this verse uh, in the connection with Isaiah 13 um, favors partial preterism. I, th I think it's a slight problem for partial preterism, but it may be that it's quoting figurative language. And we do, all, we do that all the time uh, when we uh, talk. So the question is, is that how we should understand this passage? And next uh, verse in the eschatological discourse, and if you're following along in the synoptic, um, they all will have this. It says, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And those who uh, would favor a futurist view would say, well, clearly that did not happen in 70 AD. Jesus did not come back. Um, and we've seen the Bible is crystal clear that Jesus' second coming will be a bodily visible event. Acts 1 teaches that. Very clearly, the same way Jesus left, he's going to return. He left with a body. He left where people visibly saw him leave. Acts 1 says the same way Jesus will return. The Bible is absolutely clear that the second coming of Jesus will be uh, visible bodily, um, and everybody's going to see it. The question that preterists have, partial preterists, is, is that what's being spoken of here.
because this also is a quote from the Old Testament. In fact, it's when Jesus quotes this verse in the Old Testament that the Sanhedrin decides to stone him. Um, and the quote, and you can see all the uh, passages have it, this is the quote. This is what gets Jesus crucified when he said, I'm that guy in Daniel 7. This is what Daniel says. I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the son of man. The, the reason this gets Jesus crucified is because this son of man looks awfully like God looks. And it's that whole two figures in heaven as uh, God. And when Jesus is saying, that's who I am, the high priest says, that's it. We've got to kill this guy. There came one like the son of, like a son of man, Bar Nishah, this passage in Aramaic. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. That's quoting the passage about the Messiah from Isaiah 9. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. Well, if you notice what this is describing coming with the clouds is not of a figure coming to earth. It's about a figure coming to God in heaven. So those who take a partial preterist view is saying that yes, the New Testament teaches the visible bodily return of Christ. That's just not what the passage in the eschatological discourse is talking about. The passage in the eschatological discourse is talking about the vindication of this godlike messianic king. As we continue and look at it, uh, the partial preterist, if, if uh, verse 33 is kind of the patron saint verse of futurist, the patron saint verse of partial preterism is going to be the next verse. And it's odd to me that those verses are back to back uh, in the text. But Matthew says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And if Jesus died in 30 AD and the temple is destroyed in 70 AD, that's a generation. Those who take futurist view will point out that the word generation in Greek is the word genos, and genos can also mean race. This race of people will not pass away. Two very different ways to look at this passage and what it's saying. Uh, we And we should probably ask, how is genos used elsewhere uh, in uh, Matthew? And I think if we asked that question and looked at the uh, evidence, we would find it very uh, interesting. And Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Same exact statement in Mark, same exact statement in Luke. And oddly enough, as a segue into our discussion on Friday, Revelation has the exact same statement, or in terms of its uh, intent, Revelation starts, the very first verse says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servant the things 
that must soon take place. And if you take a pre-70 view, this would be written in maybe 68 AD, and the destruction happens in 70 AD. That's an easy uh, interpretation of the word soon. If you take the 96 AD date, which is what most scholars take, then this becomes a little bit difficult. Um, how do you interpret that? And I want you to notice, and this is going to be a perfect segue into the date of Revelation that we'll look at on Friday. Notice that it isn't just that Revelation starts with um, this statement, soon take place, it ends with the exact same statement, has sent his angels to show his servants what must soon take place. So if we take a futurist approach, we would say that the material through about chapter 3, I don't know, the end of 3, I'm guessing, I'm going to call it 21, that all that may be relevant to us today, but everything from 4 to 22 uh, hasn't happened yet. Well, it's kind of odd that you have the statement, this is what will soon take place at the beginning, and this is what will soon take place at the end when the vast majority, by admission, hasn't happened. So, we are knee-deep into the controversy. You probably feel exactly the same way you felt after the Calvinism Arminian thing. It's like, okay, there's good evidence for this view. There's good evidence for this view. What do we do? Well, we might just talk about how different people have fallen out. And uh, if you're within an evangelical church, uh, more than likely you belong to one of four positions. Historic premillennialism teaches this, that the power, that the church's purity was at the highest point when Christ died on the cross, and that over time that purity of the church will uh, continue until after the seven years of the Great Tribulation, uh, Jesus will come back, uh, start his earthly reign at the end of that thousand-year reign, um, our time in heaven will start. That is a long-standing view. It goes back to uh, Irenaeus uh, at the end of the second century. Lots of people have held that view, Justin Martyr Tertullian, uh, R.A. Torrey, the uh, writer of the Fundamentals, uh, uh, Isaac Newton held that view. Lots of people have held that view. This is an ancient view. Lots of people have held it. A development of that view is called dispensational premillennialism. Um, and for a long time, Bryan College was uh, associated uh, almost exclusively with this view. This is a, a, the view of dispensationalism. Um, it goes back to, uh, in the main, to 1805, and an Anglican named J.N. Darby. Um, lots of people have held this view. My Hebrew and Aramaic teacher held this view. Uh, another one of my teachers held this view. Schofield Study Bible uh, writer, uh, the schools, Biola, Moody, and Dallas Seminary and Grace uh, Seminary all hold this view. Uh, the Ryrie Study Bible holds this view. This is a very popular view within evangelicalism, uh, and it's exactly the same as historic premillennialism, except that there is a difference uh, between the rapture and the second coming, that those are two different events. Uh, Jesus raptures the saints, 
and then there's a second coming, thousand years on earth, and then the time in heaven. Lots of really, really good people have held this view. Then you, uh, in this view, says the church's purity uh, was high at the crucifixion, and over time it will diminish, and the power of evil will be at its height when Christ comes back. Another view that a lot of good people have held is uh, called amillennialism. And amillennialism teaches that we should not expect a literal thousand years reign of Christ on earth. It, uh, Revelation, when it's talking about that, is not talking about a literal earthly kingdom. It's talking about something else. Uh, if you're in any kind of reformed uh, church, Presbyterian uh, church, this is kind of the default position that people take. Uh, reformed Baptists uh, will take this view. Some Reformed Baptists will take this view as well. This is saying that the purity of the church was low, but it will increase till Christ's return, and that the power of evil will also uh, Christ will come back, visible. All these views believe in the visible return of Christ, and then you have eternity. People who have held that view, uh, Abraham Kuyper, the Dutch uh, theologian, Burkhoff, Burkauer, um, Bruce Waltke. Um, you may not know this, but a uh, man who taught Bible here for uh, many years, uh, uh, Dr. John Anderson, the building, the annex is named after him. He actually taught Bruce Waltke Hebrew, uh, and Bruce Waltke is one of the best Hebraists we have today. He takes uh, the amillennial view. And then the last view is a minority view, uh, and it's called postmillennialism. And by and large, uh, the people who are postmillennial are also all partial preterist. That is, uh, it's hard to believe this view unless you believe some form of uh, preterism for um, Mark 13 and Revelation. But this view teaches that the purity of the church was lowest when Christ died, but it will increase until Christ's return, and that the power of evil was highest when Christ died, and that over time that power of evil on earth will be conquered. Um, there will be a messianic kingdom, uh, so we are to expect the thousand years. There is a, a little literal thousand years, but what it is is an ushering in of a time of great peace and prosperity on the earth. Um, the people who've held that view are uh, Athanasius. Uh, he's called the patron saint of postmillennialist. Uh, he's a great guy. They called him, they mocked him as being the black dwarf. Uh, he was a, a black man in very small of stature. He saved the church from uh, going into uh, Arianism. Uh, Augustine, uh, we've heard of before, uh, Eusebius, Calvin, Owen, uh, Jonathan Edwards, B.B. Uh, Warfield, the guy who invented the term inerrancy, uh, J. Gresham Machen, which I don't know if you know who he is, but he served at Westminster uh, seminary in 1930. In 1930, Bryan College asked Gresham Machen to be president of the college, and he graciously uh, turned it down, but he wrote a five-letter reason why he could not be president of Bryan College, and we have that in the archives. He was a post-millennialist. Um, so, when you see these four groups, it's like, okay, which one's the good group and who do you want to throw out? It's like, they're good people in all four of these groups. Uh, and yet, they're radically different in uh, how they understand the eschatology of the New Testament. So, what we're going to do is we're going to look at evidence ourselves. We're going to be Bereans. And so on Friday, 
we're going to look at this issue of the date of Revelation and how that in, uh, affects uh, interpretation, and we'll be in a better place to decide, okay, well, uh, which one, if any of these, is more persuasive. All right, that's what I have for you today. I'll see you on Friday.